It's midday. Hello and welcome to Joy News Today. My name is Kenneth Jesse. Coming up, big announcement. John Mahama set to resolve the Rani Maid dilemma as he officially presents his nominees for consideration by the highest decision-making body of the NDC today. But what should we expect? We have details in a few minutes. Meanwhile, the 2020 NDC running mate is challenging the NPP to introduce their own policies if they do not understand the 24-hour economy proposed by the NDC. So it is not a slogan. We don't do slogans. It's not about one day straight, one day and everything in the No, that's not. Hey, <laughs> Also ahead, there are growing concerns of stray animals taking over the streets of Accra. We will interrogate the development and seek solutions from authorities. In our Ghana Man series today, we put the spotlight on the Kintampo waterfalls in the Bono East region, where seven years ago, 20 revelers lost their lives. Through the disaster, they really helped the place. That is what brought some of the major places to come and look at the site. We have details as management of the facility says the disaster, though painful, has been a blessing in disguise. Stay with us for the next one hour to bring you details. This is where we begin this afternoon as NDC flag bearer John Mahama is expected to present his nomination for running mate to the party's National Executive Committee today. This will be after his presentation of his nominee to the Council of Elders. The NDC describes the event as a critical step towards the party's preparations towards the 2024 elections, a statement issued by the office of John Mahama reads. Right, we're bringing you details of that statement in a bit. But meanwhile, the suspense surrounding who partners opposition leader John Mahama in the crucial 2024 general elections will be brought to a finality today. It has been close to a year since the NDC elected its flag bearer, but without a running mate amidst mountain pressure, as many believe the choice of personality will be critical and a game changer in the election. John Mahama has finally made the bold move after several consultations and will present his nominees for consideration by the top hierarchy of the party today. Today's agenda includes two vital meetings. The Council of Elders will first deliberate on the issues, followed by the National Executive Committee to assess the presented nominations and grant approval. One notable person who has been highly tipped is Professor Jean Nano Pokwajiman. There was some impact being made by the running mission of, you know, Prof. Nana Jim Mensah. So I really don't think that there will be any changes. I'm shocked if there is any change. I believe the choice of a female running mate shows a commitment to gender equality and participation in leadership. I am a gender activist. I believe in, I'm very sensitive when it comes to gender. And for me, the lady or our mother, Nana Jim, did marvelously well. The NDC believes the selection will complement John Romani Mohammed's vision, as explained by Mustafa Bandi, Deputy General Secretary of the party. This slot is reserved for an individual who will complement to the vision of the president. Poster Ben Epson weighs in on the ideal personality to boost John Mohammed's candidacy. Yes, they can't pick another North now. And in the situation that they are faced, I think that Prof. Nana, with his experience and exposure, would be their best bet. As anticipation builds, all eyes are on the NDC for the big announcement, eagerly awaited by party members, political observers, and the public. Let's read to you the statement issued by the office of John Mahama on his choice of a running mate. And it says, the leader and flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, John Mahama, is set to meet with the party's National Executive Committee today to submit his nomination for running mate in accordance with the NDC constitution. Earlier this morning, Mr. Mahama will present his nominee to the Council of Elders. 
Today's event marks a critical step in the party's preparations for the upcoming general elections. The NDC constitution requires the party's presidential candidate to nominate a running mate in consultation with the National Executive Committee and the National Council of Elders. Mahama and the NDC are dedicated to building a formidable team that will work tirelessly to advance the interests of the Guinean people and reset the country on a path towards recovery and a prosperous future. He continues by saying that as leader of the NDC, Mr. Mahama remains committed to representing the interests of all Guineans and building the Ghana we want together. Meanwhile, the 2020 NDC running mate, Professor Nana Opukwajiman, is challenging the MPP to introduce their own policies if they do not understand the 24-hour economy proposed by her party. She says the NDC does not rely on slogans to run its campaign, but properly thought through policies that will change the lives of the ordinary Guinean. She was speaking at the University of Cape Coast. I remember when we proposed the four-month maternity leave. And people said, you know, we heard all kinds of things. I said, yeah, because you, you've never been pregnant before. You don't know. You, you have no idea. Do you know why sometimes the woman stays at work until the day of delivery? She doesn't go on leave. She doesn't rest. By the time she gets to the labor ward, what energy does she have? Oh, she went to deliver and she passed. In these days, how do you die? How will she not die? That's something else. And if at the time she went to the hospital, the nurse didn't know how to find her phone and call the doctor, but the hospital was operating in the night like it does during the day in a 24-hour economy. Can you imagine the lives you can save? Have you taken somebody to an emergency department at night? and being told that the daughter will come in the morning. During those hours, do you know what can happen to somebody? And what keeps happening? So it is not... In a related development, some supporters of the National Democratic Congress in the Ashanti region say the possible choice of Professor Nana Opoku Ajiman as running mate to John Mahama limits their chances of victory in the 2024 elections. According to them, her candidature did not improve the NDC's fortunes in the 2020 elections. They believe the choice of running mate must wield some influence to win votes for the NDC in the upcoming elections. Nanaya Ojima was at a press conference of the group and has filed the following report. The press conference was largely patronized by traders at the Kumasi Central Market who were clad in red to signify what they describe as economic hardship. To them, there is need for the return of the NDC with John Mahama as leader, but the group is kicking against the possible nomination of Professor Jane Nana Upukwajiman as running mate, claiming she failed to attain the needed numbers for the party in 2020. Despite the wide circulation the former running mate will be maintained, the group wants the NDC to reconsider the decision of settling on Professor Upukwajiman. She says, we used to bow for women, but now we are rooting for the men. We at the central market are dying. In 2020, we lost the election. Even central region, we didn't perform well. If we can win election, Ashanti region is very important. They are proposing former finance minister, Dr. Kabnadufo, be chosen for the role. A member of the group, Frank Basua, believes the former finance minister holds the potential to break the NPP's dominance in the Ashanti region. Professor Opokwajima can't point to any intervention at the education ministry. For nothing at all, the NPP can boast of free SHS. Under Dr. Kabna Dufo as finance minister, there was a stable economy. Ashanti region saw a lot of development. 
Dr. Dufour is best fit for the room. Saturday, I'm going IMF that. Do for time. It's a giant thing about the four. For Joy News, Nana Yaojima reporting. In a related development, political scientist Dr. Kwame Asasante says Professor Jane Nano Pukwajiman is the NDC's best bet to partner John Mahama ahead of the general elections in December. With the party set to announce its running mate later today, Dr. Asasante believes Professor Pukwajiman stands tall due to her popularity and previous experience as the party's vice presidential candidate in 2020. Um, when you are looking for a suitable candidate for this type of exercise, there are a number of things you need to uh, consider. One is popularity, because politics is a game of numbers. So you need the numbers to support you. Was this person, uh, is he or she popular to bring uh, you the numbers? That is the first question. And so popularity is critical. By popularity, we are looking at somebody, um, a lot of factors come to play, let me put it this way, in the area of popularity. Uh, she's popular because of her previous work as a scholar. Remember, she has worked in the university as an ordinary lecturer. Right. Go through the ranks to become a professor, occupy all the powerful seats, and became the first woman by chancellor. If we are looking at popularity, it's popular among what the community that we look at. Let us remember that the university community is nothing but a macrocosm of a country. So if you are able to govern that country, you have what it takes to also lead the country. And by dint of that, you are popular. Remember the students there cut across all ethnic, religious, and whatever divide, uh, political divide. They are all there. They are people from all ethnic groups, all religious groups, and even foreigners, and people in all walks of life are there. This would assess her on this uh, line. I have no doubt in my mind that she stands very tall. Right, let's go over to my colleague Blazer Suga, who is at the NDC headquarters as the party gears up to nominate its uh, vice presidential candidate. Blazer, can you hear me? Welcome to the program. What can you tell us so far? Hello, Blazer Suga, can you hear me? Right, uh, we've lost Blazer Suga there, but we'll try to connect with him in our subsequent bulletins to tell us what he has found since he's been to the NDC's headquarters. In other stories this afternoon, climate change advocates have been mourning how many traditional and cultural beliefs have been downplayed, making the environment vulnerable. Speaking at an interdisciplinary graduate school performing sustainability at the University of Cape Coast, Ames Canada Research Chair in Climate Change Science, Professor Nana Ama Brown Kluche underscored the need for a return to such days where the environment was protected. The interplay of culture, climate change, and security represent a critical and complex area of study that addresses how cultural practices, beliefs, and identities influence and are influenced by climate change and its implications for global and regional security. Speaking on the theme, scientist and climate change advocate, Professor Nanama Brown Kluche bemoan how some of the cultural and traditional practices that protected nature have been relegated to the background. The Ames Canada Research Chair in Climate Change Science is urging a return to such days. We used to have what we call um, taboos and sacred places. Days we we're not supposed to go to farm, those we're not supposed to go for fishing, and rivers or areas along the river banks people are not supposed to visit or go uh, we used to have forests and all of that i don't know if this is positive or negative but uh, 
I'm a Christian. And so I have uh, some level of reservation when I'm expressing this view, but I can also express this on a platform like this, because this we are talking about science and we're talking about climate change. So we have the belief that those traditional beliefs are no longer, I don't know, working, or the gods in those sacred places are not powerful enough and that we have that supreme God, supreme being, who will protect you anyways. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that we used to hold our cultural values and some traditional values to protect the environment so much that we will not cut trees along the riverbanks, we preserve um, farm animals and some species in the farm because we don't it's a taboo to visit farms and some other places some days of the week or sometimes in the, in the traditional calendar. But all those, or most of those, have died down because of change in beliefs. The intersection between culture, climate change and security has become a major area that requires nuanced understanding and innovative approaches to addressing the complex challenges present. Kena Hosu is a senior research fellow at the Gon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy and the Center for Migration Studies at the University of Ghana. In, from the perspective, human beings are inquisitive. So, African philosophy of adaptation is built in what taboos, myths, do's, and don'ts. So, today, looking at it, you don't go to river at the riverside or farm at certain places. All distance is to what maintain biodiversity and the ecological balance. But here we are today. Um, our fishermen are using all forms of what unsustainable fishing methods. People have farmed to the extent that even the watershed, the source of rivers they have and the population is increasing and when we talk of youth bulge in africa the funny thing is the demography director of the center for study and promotion of cultural sustainability university of maidugri nigeria professor james b saliba believes issues of climate change should be given a huge attention considering its impact on the lives of the people the Interdisciplinary Graduate School Performing Sustainability is a collaborative training network for graduate students run by the University of Cape Coast, the University of Hildesheim, Germany, and the University of Maiduguri, Nigeria. Let's head to Parliament now, where MP for Asawasi and former Minority Chief Whip, Mohamed Muntaka Mubarak, says MPs, especially those who leave the house, are battling with terrible living conditions. Former Kwandai MP Likpale Mokujo Teria served in parliament for 20 years but struggled during the end of his life to take care of his ailing health. MPs have said Muntaka Mubarak says judges of the Supreme Court retire on their salaries, but an MP who serves for 20 years is left at his own fate. Well, Parliamentary Affairs correspondent Kuku Asante joins us from parliament with more. Kuku, we understand. The State of the Nation address debate is now set to be concluded today. What more can you tell us? Well, so on the, on the top story about MPDs and the concerns about their condition of service, it's something that has been coming up continuously on the floor. MPs are worried that they, they, they do not collectively take care of their interests and as much they play a lot of politics with it. In fact, judges. Right, uh, quick question, can you hear me? Unfortunately, we've lost our parliamentary affairs correspondent, Kwekua Santi there, who was uh, describing what happened in parliament today. We'll try to reconnect with him to tell us more and what has become of the State of the Nation Address debate, which is set to be concluded today. I understand Kwekua Santi is back on the line. Kwekua, you were making a point about MPs raising uh, the point in parliament about their state of affairs when they leave the house. Um, the point I was making about judges of the Superior Court of Judicature retiring on their salaries, MPs want something similar. Of course, it's not being concretized in terms of speaking about this, but MPs say 
that when their colleagues leave parliament, especially for Mr. Lee Parliament, who said for 20 years and still struggle to take off his health, this is something that he believes the state must look at. And in fact, the state of the nation address that you referenced, initially the understanding was that the debate will conclude tomorrow when the leaders do. But if you look at the other part of today, the understanding is that the leaders will now conclude the state of the nation address debate and thank the president. So we expect that one or two more members of parliament will speak and then the minority leader, Dr. Kisela Tufosin, and the majority leader, Alexander Fanyo Makin, will wrap up the debate so that the House can proceed to do with other business. They've been detailing or dealing with the state of the nation address for the last one week, and MPs have used this as an opportunity to talk about the governing new patriotic party's handling of the economy. While the NDP MPs have also used that as a basis to say that whilst things are not going so well at this time, the government is doing a lot to turn the corner, and they believe that by the end of the year, things will get much better. And I can attest to the facts for the two of them. Well, let's bring you more stories this afternoon. As the World Bank Group says, it has a long-standing relationship with the Republic, despite recent speculations that the Britain Woods Institution may soon be cutting aid and development assistance programs to Ghana after Parliament passed the Human Sexual Rights and Ghanaian Family Values Bill. Alarmed by caution from the international community or the possible sanctions that may arise from affecting the purportedly discriminatory legislation, Ghana's finance ministry, in a secular to the presidency, expressed concerns that the country could face serious financial challenges if the president goes ahead to assent to the bill. However, the Britain Woods Institution says it has a long-standing relationship with Ghana. Head of our Foreign Affairs and Diplomatic Desk, Blaise Suga, has more. President Kofado is being tested more than ever. Parliament has indeed passed the proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values bill. And soon that document will be at his desk begging for a presidential assent. At a meeting with the diplomatic community last night, President Kofado says he will be guided by the Supreme Court on this matter. But suffice it to say that I have learned that today a challenge has been mounted at the Supreme Court by a concerned citizen to the constitutionality of the proposed legislation. In the circumstances, it would be as well for all of us to hold our hands and await the decision of the court before any action is taken. President Tekufando has given his assurances to the diplomatic community in Ghana that the country will hold its long-standing attachment to the values of rule of law and the respects for human rights. As the country awaits its ultimate decision on the passage of the proper sexual human rights and family values bill, a section of the public remain divided on whether or not the president should give his assent to the passage of this controversial bill. Oh, I don't think well, they should be allowed to, to make it public like they have their right to actually practice whatever they want to practice. So I think the president has to sign it, the bill, for the law to be passed. Yeah. Dubai uh, is an example. Those Arab countries, they are an example of it. They are doing, I heard one, I don't know whether it's a minister or in US saying uh, Ghana will lose um, tourism advantages. Which, which I don't think is true. Dubai is not condoling LGBTQ, and they have the best tourists when it comes to tourism. Dubai is on top. So we have our values. I don't think we, should, we have to allow somebody to actually do uh, It's something, if we don't sign, uh, it may end our result to some sanctions. And also, we have to also consider our societal values. So Ghana as a, as a society, do we, or our norms, do our norms allow us to assess such kind of, uh, let me say in code, conduct? Then if it's no, regardless of the, the sanction that imposed to us, I think we should hold our integrity. We should hold fast to our uh, values, the customs and values that made us Ghanaians. The president should do whatever is in the best interest for the country. Because Ghana is a country that relies heavily on foreign aid, the burden lies on him to choose between foreign aid and the customs and values of the country. 
and the president is a human rights lawyer. I believe you take the decision that is best for the country. The World Bank in an email correspondence says it has, quote, a long-standing and productive relationship with Ghana, unquote. Responding to their position on the passage of the bill, the Britain Watch Institution says, quote, the bill has not yet been signed into law. We generally do not comment on bills, unquote. It remains unclear if the financial institution may take a punitive approach if the bill becomes fully enacted. Bless us, Ogan reporting for Joy News, Accra. In our Ghana Man series, we put a spotlight on the Kintampo waterfalls in the Bono East region, where seven years ago, 20 revelers lost their lives. Management of the facility says the disaster, though painful, has increased the fortunes of the facility. My colleague Anas Sabit went back to the waterfalls, where clean water still flows all year round. Michael Afake Delali is a site manager here. He takes us through when the Clinton waterfall was first discovered as well as its source. The Dabo waterfall is one of the major tourist attractions in Ghana. It was discovered in the 18th century by Nana Trema. And through hunting, he found out that this is the wonderful thing that uh, God has given to Kentampo. So over the years, from the 18th century till now, it has been a major force of attraction that many people come from far and near, from the north, from the south, just to witness the waterfall. The waterfall is in, is in three stages. There is stage one, stage two, and stage three. Seven years down the lane, how that particular incident has impacted this particular side. Has it been positive or has it been negative? I think um, uh, for the disaster, it really helped the place. That is what brought some of the major places to come and look at the site. And I think uh, the rehabilitation and the uh, redevelopment, I think that brought the new stairs and a couple of structures and also made the administration a very functional administration. In terms of visitations, Michael tells me there's been a massive improvement with the facility recording up to 26,000 visitations in the year 2023 compared to a figure of 22,000 in the year 2022. Every year we do the annual uh, statistics collation. So last year we were over 26,000 people visited the site. I think we did 22,000 the previous year, and last year we did 26,000. With the 2017 disaster still fresh in the minds of many revelers, what are some of the major security measures taken by management to keep similar future disasters? And also with the security agencies, normally when it's an occasion, they don't forget to come. Uh, I think if you were here for some of the first issues, you find out that when the fire service comes, they conduct the kind of work way. When the fire service comes, they conduct the kind of work way. The police also have the gates inspecting. And the immigration people are also checking around. So I think all, and the ambulance is always packed in, at the entrance. So I think all these people, they come on board. And when they are in, I think, I would say that it just tells us that we are actually prioritizing the lives of the revelers and not just the money. The major challenge facing the smooth runner facility today is the issue of bush fires around the green zone of the waterfalls. Michael tells me more needs to be done to help address this worrying menace. Since people farm along or close to the site, in the way of control burning, the fire gets into our yard. And most of the times, they're able to burn the green around. They don't touch the major facilities, but the green, the green, which is very important. So that is a major problem that we face. As we mark the Heritage Month, Joseph Apiaje tells me that the region and the country at large has to celebrate the Kintampo waterfall as a treasure and admonish others to visit the area. We have to celebrate it because this is the treasure that we have as the people of Kintampo, people of Bono East and Ghana at large. So even as we celebrate the Heritage Month, this is our heritage which ought to be properly preserved for the future generation also come to benefit from it. Well, the 2017 disaster might have caused a lot of havoc due to the lives lost, but it has turned out to be a blessing in disguise with an increase in visitations year in, year out. From the Kintampo Waterfalls, for joining us.
My name is Anas Sadiq, reporting. Moving on, the Judicial Service is urging the public to consider resorting to alternative dispute resolution when they file their cases in court. According to the Director of ADR, Alex Nate, the process guarantees a faster adjudication of cases and ensures that privacies of parties are protected. He was speaking at a public debate on ADR in Cape Coast. According to the Judicial Service, the court has adopted ADR to ensure that justice is done and done efficiently and effectively. Director of ADR, Alex Nati, says the service is recommending to parties who come to court to consider using ADR to ensure the protection of their privacy and also ensure a speedy resolution of their disputes. You have the option of staying in the courtroom. When you choose to stay in the courtroom, I can assure you that, that through no fault of anybody, the case will travel longer than you expect because that is the nature of litigation. We call it rights-based. When you bring your case and your opponent also comes under a particular law, exercising a particular right, we will hold on and listen to the person uh, before we come back to the substantive matter. So uh, legal rights here and there will prolong the process. And so today in Ghana, we have introduced ADR. ADR guarantees a faster resolution of every dispute that is referred to it. And so when you come to court and you don't want to delay in the court uh, against your expectation, then the recommended option, if your case is to come to ADR, is to opt for ADR. And that is the sermon her leadership, the chief justice, to deliver. A justice of the Court of Appeal, her ladyship justice, Angelina Mesa, of the benefit parties tend to derive under ADR. And I also urge the trial judges to direct their registrars to compile a list of cases amenable to settlement and notify the parties accordingly. That way, the court users who intend using ADR to settle their disputes will have ample time to prepare. If you don't do that, they will show up during the ADR weekend and uh, tell you, oh, yes, um, I didn't mind settling the matter, but I have to go and talk to my Abushia Penny who nominated me to come. Oh, my head of family, um, is uh, in Accra. My head of family is out of the jurisdiction. If you notify them in time, they will get all the necessary consent, um, do all the consultations so that when they show up, they will be ready to settle their disputes. Shanti Regional Supervising High Court Judge Justice Kofi Akungwa expressed the hope that many disputants would lean towards ADL to settle their differences. Daryl Kwao will be here with the latest in business after the break. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Financial institutions have been aired to aid in creating a supportive business environment for local firms to thrive. Chief Executive Officer for Kasona Global Imaging, John Chibu, is concerned about the rate at which local businesses struggle to access credit from banks. He's calling for more innovative ways for banks and other financial institutions to support these businesses. He spoke to Joy Business. I don't have the qualification to speak to anything related to government. I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing tax law for 32 years. What do I know about government? But I do know one thing. Because I know it well. As a businessman, I can talk to you. As a businessman, I think that our financial institutions has a big role to play in making Ghana self-sufficient in the life-saving tools I've been talking about. If a man goes to a bank and the bank says, I 
I need all the land you have. I need the home you have. In fact, I need, I need your firstborn too. And you pay me 45% of what you make. You, you've already, you know, you've dampened his enthusiasm. He's not going to be able to do it. He, he, he doesn't, he has no control over how many patients are going to walk through his door. How does he know he's going to make enough money to give to you? I don't know if any of you read The Merchant of Venice. Now, as part of measures to bridge the gap between academia and industry, the CFA Society Ghana says it is key to support young people in acquiring more skills. According to local coordinator for the CFA Institute Research Challenge, Emmanuel Ojemboache, corporate firms uh, should deepen engagement with young people to fit in industry after school. He spoke to Joy Business at the third Institute Research Challenge. The CFA Institute Research Challenge is a worldwide intercollegiate competition between teams of students. The challenge is a unique education opportunity to apply what one has learned in the classroom to real world practice in equity research. The CFA Institute Research Challenge is an annual research challenge that is held for almost uh, all the global universities around the world. So it starts with the local, which is the national one, and then you progress to the sub-regional, and then to the regional, and then the global. So this year, for Ghana, this is our third time we've been participating in the event. It's, it brings together all universities around the country. This, is, this year we're having five universities uh, compete in the area of equity research reports. So they take a, a company listed on Ghana Stock Exchange, exchange and then they do a thorough industry like uh, report on them the aim or the purpose of this competition is to ensure that we bridge the gap between academia and then uh, real industry so that gives us the opportunity to really put them on their feet to pay to top pension fund managers in the country as to uh, either they should make a, a, a buy or sell a whole decision on a listed company so this what uh, the competition sought to achieve. The winning team was the capital curators representing Ashanti University. Second place was Team Valorem representing the University of Ghana. And that's it for the segment. The news continues after the break. Time now to bring you sports on a journey today with me, Muftar Nabila Abla. President Ekufuadu has called on Ghanaians to lower their expectations in this year's African Games, which is being hosted in Accra. Ghana has had a difficult start with tennis, men and female teams all struggling to go past the quarterfinal stage of the competition. Speaking during the 67th anniversary of Ghana's independence, President Ekufuadu said, though he wants the country to win, he's called on Ghanaians to throw their weight behind their teams without expecting many medals. Ghanaians, on Friday, 8th March, the 13th African Games will be officially opened in Accra, and we shall be playing host to 53 African nations that will participate in the Games. We've gone up to a lot of trouble and expense to be able to stage the games, and we are expecting them to be successful. I'm looking at our guest of honor, President Alassane Ouattara, and I wonder if I should draw some parallels. He has also just staged the AFCON 2023, which was postponed to 2024, instead of the scheduled 2023. The games here, too should have been held in 2023, but were postponed to 2024. Football attempts to attract more attention, and therefore the AFCON in Côte d'Ivoire dominated the headlines for the one month it took place. The Ivorian national team, the Elephants, defied all odds and won the competition. I am not promising a Ghana clean sweep of track and field. That would be a miracle. I'm promising a happy and exciting month for all our visitors. We in Ghana know how to set the lead. We did it in 1957 when we were the first African nation in sub-Saharan Africa to gain independence from colonial bondage. We have got other firsts with doubtful boats. But we have always managed to get out of difficult situations. 
with amazing grace. We owe it to ourselves and to the rest of Africa to be that shining black star. We owe it to ourselves and to the rest of Africa we can be proud and we owe it to ourselves and to the rest of Africa to be a prosperous nation and we are getting there and we shall get there. Well, during the Christmas activities, uh, the National Sports Authority decided to close down the Accra Sports Stadium to footballing activities. One of the clubs that was affected by the decision of the government agency was Accra House of Oak. Board chairman of the club, Togba Afede, appears not to have gotten over that decision from the National Sports Authority. And he says that that singular move by the authority shows how the country has been ill prepared in terms of sporting infrastructure. It's a big shame. Again, that's a negative for our game. You know, it shows again the positive of uh, football infrastructure in this country. You know, that uh, certainly four teams that were using a class plus stadium have to go and look for alternatives. Again, it shows like, how much we fail to plan ahead. You know, and that is why, again, the more is why I'm proud of what us is doing. After we've done all that we are doing currently, the only thing I'll be lacking is uh, a stadium. Indeed, I'm very, very disappointed that. Uh, Accra Stadium was not available to us throughout December. It's not going to be available to us for another one month or so. It's unfortunate uh, that we should be suffering this kind of deprivation uh, every year. Last year, you know, last Christmas, before the recent one, we were denied because to close the stadium for concerts. And with the same happened uh, at the recent Christmas as well. Nobody says that you must use the stadium for only football. Yes, Wembley can be used for box, boxing tournaments. Wembley can be used for concerts. But nobody will stop, I mean, close down Wembley to sports for an extended period to allow for these other peripheral uses. On the contrary, they will time those uses so that, you know, they can still go with the football calendar. You know, but here it's like our thinking has become so warped, unfortunately. So it's sad that we, we have lost days of the stadium during December and we are going to continue to not to use again. Which is unfortunate. Look at the league table and see those who are leading. Check out their home performance. You know, I mean let's be real as a people. Let's 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 be real. Let's be more analytical. And then you see that it's not the case that House of Folk or Tokwa are doing that badly. But you see there is something in the game that is worrying. You know, it's, it's really sad, particularly in a country where People exploit home advantage to the fullest, where they want to win at home by fair or foul means. Then you don't even have the use of the home at all. I mean, that is very bad. Of course, we have never been known to intimidate at home. I mean, who can intimidate a class sports stadium where the pitch is so far from the, the, the spectators? Unlike other places where the distance between the, 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 the linesman and the spectators can be as, as, as short as uh, two meters. You know, so to be deprived of the use of even what we have that we don't even really exploit in terms of advantage is, is really very, very sad. Well, the man who took the decision to close down the Accra Sports Stadium, uh, Professor Peter Chumesi, he's been sacked as the Director General of the National Sports Authority. His place will be taken over by uh, Doji Numekeva, who was part of a uh, or who was working with Ghana's High Commission in the UK. So he takes over. A letter that was sent to the board of the National Sports Authority on February 26 said that he has 14 days to accept the appointment or otherwise. There's also a major changes or some major changes in the authority as the regional director for Northern Region, Salama Tuharasan, has also been transferred and the central regional head, Alexander Tiku, has been transferred. Daniel Sape, who has uh, Volta region has also been transferred, and also the head for Ashanti region, Emmanuel Apia Kubi, he's also been transferred. All these people have been moved to the headquarters in Accra. That's your sports now. We do have more sports stories on myjoyonline.com. 
Good afternoon, welcome to the Showbiz segments with me, Jacqueline and Sumayabwa. Now, beauty has its way of life and ignite the cultural heritage of every nation. As part of the Ghana Man celebrations, we take you back to how beauty has evolved. Joy Prime has been exploring the revolution of traditional Ghanaian hairstyle, nail art, and makeup trends and highlighting the cultural significance and changes over the years. Joy Duan Yame has more in this report. These were the beauty trends between the early 80s and 90s. Women within these periods rocked on these styles as they were top-notch and attractive. In the olden days, do you remember the stretching comb? Yes. You would sit in between the <laughs> lap, right? Yes. And then they would put the stretching comb in a coal pot. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, somebody's Fun. busy yeah. funding yeah. it, yeah. papa. Yeah. Oh, it's a hot comb. Like yeah. Like a well, so you call it hot comb now. So it was called a <laughs> so yes, stretching yes, comb because yes. it will stretch your, your hair. hair. The heat in it will stretch your hair and make it um, less difficult to manage right. so that you have the hair stretched and everything. And then gradually it moved to perm hair yeah. because you get got in some chemicals that will break the bones and make them straight. Yeah. But as generations evolved, the trend also changed. Now, these styles have revolutionized with technology. Now this is contemporary. This is now like modern times. We are, again, the young girls just expressing themselves through them being themselves, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So this is more natural. We're looking at gloss. We're looking at just subtle makeup, it being themselves, but just enhancing yes. their features. Mm. Modernization has certainly changed a vast number of things, including beauty, but it may never end so far as technology revolves with generations. However, have you thought of the futuristic look of beauty? This lady represents the future. <laughs> so the hair actually is Koroba. I think yeah. everybody knows yeah, Koroba. If you look at the background of this, it's from Zimbabwe. Yeah. Yes. But you'll see that in Zimbabwe, they also do some Ghanaian braids. Mm -hmm. In Nigeria, mm -hmm. we've mm -hmm. seen yeah. Nigerian mm -hmm. braids crossing yeah. across yeah. different mm -hmm. hairstyles. Yeah. And you know the beauty about this is with the hair extensions, you can blend different colors to your yes. skin tone. Beauty has its way of life and igniting the cultural heritage of every nation. The Ghana Man celebration allows Ghanaians to explore the diversity of the motherland from clothes, beads, hair, nails, makeup and others don't you think it will be interesting to relive the olden way of life chua nyama's report read to you the wrap for the showbiz segments with me jacqueline and suma yabwa ken i think that is one of the best initiatives spotify yeah you know, creating Ghanaian music and all that yeah. thank you very much jackie for bringing us the latest in entertainment that's it for the bulletin my name is kenneth jesse we have more news on myjoyonline.com bye-bye